Hey, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or maybe good evening, who knows? Uh, welcome to this new episode of SageMaker Fridays. And this is actually the last episode for a little while. So it's the, I guess, the mid season finale. Uh, but no cliffhanger, uh, no one dies <laughs> that I'm aware of. Okay, just so you know. So don't be scared. Uh, and I guess you already know, but my name is Julian <laughs> and I'm a dev advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. And as always, please meet my co-presenter. Hi everyone, my name is Ségolène and I'm a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. My role is to help customers get their ML project on the right track in order to create business value as fast as possible. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Um, so once again, we're live, 100% um, discussion uh, and demo, no slides, except, of course, the, uh, the final slide with the resources, but that's about it. Uh, if you've got questions, please ask all your questions in the chat, and uh, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Okay, don't be shy. Make sure you learn as much as possible. So today yes, yes. is a special episode, <laughs> not only because it's, it's the mid-season right? finale, but it also because I, today I'm having my revenge, right? Yes, So yes, yes. for a number of episodes, Sego has been the machine learning expert, and, uh, you know, I've been asking lots of silly questions and that she was very kind and, uh, and answered. But today is a more technical episode, right? Yeah. And Sego told me, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. There's so much I don't understand here. So now you, under now you feel what it's like to be me, yeah? <laughs> So, so I'm going to ask the silly question. The yeah, question. well, you can ask all those silly questions, you know, for a change, and I'll try to answer as well as you usually do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. So, actually, this week, uh, we're going mm -hmm. to focus on something I don't think we've ever discussed, mm -hmm. um, either this season or the previous season, and it is uh, importing and exporting models. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so far, we've been uh, training and deploying all the way, mm -hmm, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Doing the full life cycle mm -hmm, on, uh, on SageMaker. But sometimes uh, it's not what we need, mm -hmm. right? So tell us a little more. So um, what we see that is uh, SageMaker convert, uh, covers the complete ML cycle, mm -hmm. data experimenting, modeling, training, optimizing, deploying, and monitoring. Yes, and so many additional things so many seen this things. <laughs> exactly <laughs> but sometimes we want to to be free and we don't have to go end to end on okay. SageMaker. Mm -hmm. and the good news julian is that we can cherry pick the feature uh, that makes the most sense uh, for your uh, ml project right now okay yes so flexibility and modularity are okay. super important so, so give us some examples so for instance you don't have to train and deploy on SageMaker. Mm -hmm. That's big news. Yes, because yeah, if you yeah, if you listen to us for a while, it's like oh, oh build, you train, build, build, train, train deploy, deploy, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you, and and you're all tired of that. So. <laughs> so you could do one or the other. Okay. So why? Okay. So why would we train on SageMaker and not deploy on SageMaker? So we train on SageMaker and that we don't deploy on SageMaker because, for instance, you can have some business constraints. You okay. are not allowed to uh, deploy in the cloud. Okay. So you Makes can train. Sense. Yeah, some deploy. use cases are strictly on premise. Exactly. Okay. That works. Um, you have a company wide uh, technology choice. So, uh, for instance, your deployment is standardized on Docker or mm -hmm. you've got uh, an already existing uh, CI CD workflow. Okay. All right. So. Okay, so deploying on SageMaker is not your technical option. Exactly. That works. Okay. I, I uh, understand. Otherwise, another uh, reason for not deploy, uh, deploying on SageMaker, uh, you have some uh, strong compliance uh, requirements and uh, you need to build and deploy on your own IMI. Okay, yeah. So managed endpoints are not, exactly. are not an option. Okay, so these are good reasons and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you know, there are more, but these are, yeah, these are yeah, the ones mm, we, yes, we yeah. usually hear from mm -hmm. customers. And that's totally okay, you know, that's fine. So now what about the <laughs> the other side? Why would we not train on SageMaker? Because it's so easy, it's so scalable. <laughs> it's so scalable. Why would you not do that and still deploy on SageMaker? So right now, 
we don't we don't train but we deploy yes right so um why not training again business constraints you are not allowed to store your data in the cloud okay that okay. could be yes and it's it's totally up for discussion but for some organization the current status quo is nope don't do it okay so fair enough fair enough um, another company-wide technology choice, uh, you need to amort uh, amortize uh, your on-prem uh, infrastructure. Ah, you spend lots of money, <laughs> money on servers before, and yeah, the CFO yeah. doesn't yeah. understand why yes, you need yes, to help. Yeah. Ah, okay, brings back memory. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's not a really good reason, but, but it's still okay, is, CFOs uh, usually win those discussions. Exactly. Okay, okay, so you have to adapt. All right, I get it. Or finally, you have uh, no training needs. Uh, your current models uh, just work fine. So yeah, it's actually yeah, it's actually a good one. Um, this one, um, yeah. So you train your models, uh, or you use existing models from maybe partners. Exactly. You don't. You just don't train, and mm. and you want to deploy on, in the cloud. So just deploy, no training required. Okay. Um, and there's another one that you could hear from time to time. <laughs> Yes. Which is, I don't know no, how to do. Know. I don't know how to train, or I don't know how to deploy. And come on, my friends, it isn't. With, it's not a valid. It's no. not a good reason at all, right? You can go and watch all the previous episodes. So no, I don't know how to do it. Nope, sorry. I'll be, <laughs> no, I'll be firm on that one. I won't accept it. Okay, sorry. All right. So, um, so again, when we do the whole end-to-end -end, uh, workflow, you know, we, we use the estimator to train, mm -hmm. we use the predictor to deploy, and we don't even see what the model looks like, mm -hmm. right? It, we know it's in S3, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, it, it's copied in S3 once training is complete, and we assume this is where, you know, uh, the predictor takes it and deploys it, but we've never really looked at mm -hmm. what the model is. And right? that's important. And it's important because if you want to import, you need to know what the artifact yes, should be, exactly. right? What did you put in S3 to deploy? Mm -hmm. And if you want to export, well, it's the, the other side of the story. What should you look for in S3 and what do you do with it mm -hmm. in order to uh, uh, use it in, you know, in a different context, okay? So a SageMaker model. Can we show? Can yes, we show can us. take a look. Yeah, so <laughs> let's, let's show my screen. Uh, let's switch to... Uh, uh, to SageMaker Studio, and let's take any job here, uh, and we can just literally take. Uh, why don't we take? Why don't we take? Um, well, we can take. Yeah, I want to test show XJBoost maybe, if I can find one. Uh, it's hidden somewhere. All right, no, no worries. We can take. Let's take a TensorFlow model. So you can just take any model, and you right-click on this thing. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yes, you're, yeah, sorry, sorry. It's Friday, and I'm not getting younger. All right. Sorry. See why why I need Sego. Okay. She keeps me on track. Okay, so right-click on Open in Trial Details. Okay, and this opens. Um, uh, a new window with all the information you, you need to know. And of course, there's this thing called artifacts. And here we can see the model artifacts, right? And the first thing we see is yeah. that, okay, we have a, a long S3 URI, but we have a, a file or an object, I should say, called model.tar.jz. So let's, why don't we take one of those? And yes. Uh, yeah, maybe I can just, do I have a terminal open here? Yes. Okay, so why don't we just copy one of those things? Okay. And what's in there? <laughs> what did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's a file called xjb.model. And obviously, if we look at a TensorFlow model, and we'll look at TensorFlow and PyTorch and uh, a few more things today, um, we'll see different files mm -hmm. in the, inside the artifact. But this is the model that was saved by your training job. Okay. okay? So remember, inside your uh, training script, you save the model in a well-known place, which is usually slash opt slash ml slash model inside the container. And then SageMaker takes that, 
and builds that model that charge of JZ file and, and, and copies it to S3, right? Mm -hmm. So all, all of automatic. But this is really the model that's saved by your script. So in this case, it's simply a pickled uh, XJBoost model, right? Is it me? Pickled? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, you're asking the silly questions. Okay, great. <laughs> so pickle is a serialized, uh, serialization format for Python. Okay. okay, so it's basically, as we'll see, we'll load one in, in a few minutes. So uh, we can just load the serialized object straight into our XGBoost uh, uh, code and, and use it right, right away. Okay, um, so it's it's about the same thing. So again, for different algos, for PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, MXNet, and so on, mm -hmm. um, what's inside the artifact is going to be uh, different, but the process is always the same. Okay. Right? So th that's really all you need to know. Uh, go and find the model artifact at the output location, copy it, extract it, and again, depending on the framework, this is where you find the model, and uh, and then. Or you should know what to do with it. Okay. Okay. So um, simple as that. These are SageMaker models. So I can uh, I can. And what about uh, yeah. tensor, TensorFlow models? It's going to be different. Or? Yeah. So TensorFlow, as we'll see in, uh, in in one of the examples, so TensorFlow models uh, trained with the TensorFlow container on SageMaker okay. are saved in a TensorFlow serving format. Okay. So TensorFlow serving is the model server for TensorFlow. Okay. So it's a, it's a different format, but we'll see an example. Cool. We'll actually load one on my on my laptop uh, using Docker. Whoa! Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I told you it's a technical episode. <laughs> not so not a lot of machine learning today, but lots of lots of cool stuff still. I hope. Cool. Why well, Docker is very nice. <laughs> yes. Okay. So should we start with importing models? Cool. Yeah. Um, so again. Um, importing models means uh, we have an existing model, okay? Um, we could also call it, you know, bring your own. Okay. Maybe it's a model you train on your laptop okay. because you, it's a model you already have. Um, it's a model you downloaded from GitHub, oh, right? Could yeah. come from a model zoo. Okay, okay that's yeah. another scenario. Uh, so, long story short, you have a model and you want to deploy it on SageMaker, okay? okay? So let, let's look at uh, an example. So we, we'll start with XGBoost, okay? So uh, here I'm, I'm basically training uh, uh, an XGBoost model on the direct marketing data set, which we've used quite a few times, uh, and we train this locally, okay? So even though I'm training here in the notebook, I'm not using managed infrastructure, okay? okay? So, okay, loading the data set, doing some silly uh, feature engineering, <laughs> Uh, and then training, and this is really where this happens, right? Mm -hmm. Vanilla XGBoost code to train this thing, okay? Training in place. So th this code you could absolutely run on your laptop just like, just like that, same code, okay? So the one, the first thing I think you need to uh, check or, or note is which XGBoost version mm -hmm. are, we, are you using here, okay? Because when you when you train and deploy on SageMaker, we automatically select, you know, if you say, I want to train on X, with XGBoost 1.2, mm -hmm. then of course, when we deploy, we use that same version, to deploy, right? The, the containers, the built-in containers take care of that. But if you if you tr if you you take a pre-trained model and, and deploy it, then of course, you need, to you need to make sure you deploy with the same versions, right? Because all those libraries, they move very fast, mm -hmm. and the, the, the model, the format of the model can actually change. Uh, there was a, a, a very big change uh, after XGBoost uh, 0.9, mm -hmm. where the format of the models completely changed, and uh, it's not guaranteed you can load them with uh, more recent versions. Okay. Okay? Uh, and you may even have to retrain them. Yes. Okay. okay, so it's important to understand, okay, what version did I use for training? Okay, so here I'm using one to one which won't be a problem at all. Okay, so it trains, and and voila, as we say. <laughs> okay, so what we have now is uh, we save the model, okay, locally, mm -hmm. right? So I can see uh, XJBoost model. Let me get to the right spot. Um, where is this thing? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's it's in here. Uh, bring your own XGBoost. Yes. Um, okay. All right. 
Okay, so this is the model and fine, right? Mm. It's what you would expect. So now what we need to do is to package the model for SageMaker, mm. okay? And it's not complicated because now we, we know what to do, right? So first we need to create that model artifact, mm -hmm. okay? And, uh, and yeah, so just build a model tar jz file with that, uh, um, with that uh, mm -hmm. pickled object, okay? That's it. Then of course you need to upload it to S3 mm -hmm. because this is where SageMaker expects it. And then you deploy, okay. right? So here we're using an object that I don't think we've used before, which, which is the model object in mm -hmm. the SageMaker SDK. We've used estimators to train and then the return value from, from training is a predictor and we deploy. So here we don't have the estimator, mm -hmm. right? So what we need to do is we need to create this XJBoost model uh, with the location of the model in S3. Okay, which version we're using. So this is where you need to know which to avoid is. problems. Okay. Just try to have the same version. And we need a short script. Okay? Okay. Because let me show you the script. XJBScript.py. Because we need to provide a simple uh, model loading function. Okay. okay? And basically, um, creating a booster object and then loading the model from uh, the artifact okay. that we stored in S3. And this is going to work, I'm going to say, 99.9% .9 of the time. So you can keep using this function for XGBoost. Okay. Um, I, I think there are very few cases where, where this wouldn't work. Okay. Uh, and again, you know, this. Uh, when you use the built-in estimators, built-in as predictor, uh, this is kind of, you know, this is kind of built-in, right? But here we need to provide it. Okay. And then, well then, okay, this creates, uh, so XJB model is actually uh, that predictor object. So this is really equivalent to training, right? Okay. And you can see the same, the next cell is the same. Mm, we call deploy. dot deploy yeah, exactly okay. as, as, okay. as we've done before. So this is really equivalent to, hey, I've trained a model on SageMaker and I've got an object that I can run. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we deploy it and then we can predict with it, with predict, just like we've done in the past. Okay, so- Same logic. Same logic, mm -hmm. yeah. So the only difference is you have your local model, put it in a model artifact, put that artifact in S3, uh, create that model object, and then you can call deploy. Okay. So no, again, nothing, yeah, nothing fancy, right? Yeah. Nothing fancy. Okay. I understand. Yeah. Simple. <laughs> okay. Let's let's look at uh, let's look at TensorFlow, right? Because you wanted to know about TensorFlow. So same process. We're going to train a local model. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here I'm reusing my uh, Fashion MNIST image classifier. It's a good toy example, and we train locally, locally meaning, because you could say hey, it's in studio, it's not local. Yeah, fair point. Uh, locally means I am not using managed infrastructure on SageMaker, okay? So I'm training inside the notebook, so to speak. All right, so once again, we need to be careful with TensorFlow versions, yeah, yeah. okay? Uh, because some, some APIs could change and, uh, and you could have, uh, you know, breaking changes from one version to the next. So try to stay at least with the same major dot minor version. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final digit is usually not a problem. Okay, we load the data set, uh, do some, some preparation on the data set itself, instantiate our model, compile, train, save. Okay. And of course, you will get all the notebooks. Okay, I'm already hearing you scream, can I get that? Yes. <laughs> Yes, you know you're going to get all of it, okay? <laughs> uh, this is really the critical step here, okay? So um, there are different formats to save uh, TensorFlow models. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could save maybe a pickled object. That's not what you want to do here. Here, you really want to save them in TensorFlow serving format. So if you're not familiar, TensorFlow serving is a model server. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of the TensorFlow project. Why is this important? It's important because that's what the uh, containers, the SageMaker containers use okay. to deploy. Okay, so inside the inference 
container for TensorFlow, we have TensorFlow serving looking for one of those mm -hmm. uh, models. So we need to do that uh, properly. Okay, so we need to save it in the right format. Okay, so train, train, train. <laughs> okay, and now we have. Okay, we have this uh, one. folder here. Yeah, I call it one because usually, you know, it's version one. You know, if you you could have multiple uh, versions of a model inside an artifact. And you could ask TensorFlow Serving to deploy one or the other. Okay. Okay. So it's uh, it's the, how I do it. And this is what you should see, right? And you can see here the, the format. Uh, the format is a little more complicated. You could have, uh, these are the actual parameters. You could have multiple checkpoints if you use checkpointing, et cetera. It's not super complicated, but uh, yeah, and you can see the model is saved in protobuf format, which is okay. another serialization format from, from Google, widely used. Um, so that's what it should look like, right? So if you save the model and it doesn't look like this, you didn't use the right format. And, okay. and don't go any further because you won't be able to deploy it. Yeah? Okay, so that's what we should have. Now, what do we do with this? Well, we kind of do the same thing, yeah? We're going to build a model tar jz file okay okay we said, yeah. hmm? the 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 main mistake that i've done again and again and again is not not uh not building the tar file from that root from the one uh, okay. Root, okay so if your tar file contains just variables uh and save model.pb and assets you won't be able to deploy it. okay so that model version, model name, whatever name you want to give to that, needs to be at the root okay. of the tar file. Okay. Um, yeah, very frustrating because you know you do everything right, you miss this one step, and you deploy and you yeah. deploy and it fails and it fails. It's like, come on, the model is in there. Why doesn't TensorFlow serving find it? Okay. Make good sure. Good yeah, 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 yeah. It, it drove me nuts. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm I'm a slow learner, and you know, it took me a while to to figure this out earlier. So now we upload that to S3, and we, of course, we create a TensorFlow model from that artifact, careful with the versions, okay, okay. once again, and we just call deploy. What I like about this is we don't need to have an inference script, oh, okay? yes. because TensorFlow serving will just load the model and it includes, you know, the purpose of a model server is to uh, uh, is to include you know all the inference logic, so you don't you don't need to do that, unless unless you're using exotic serialization. Oh, okay. So if you use different if you use something different from I don't know NumPy or or JSON, like the usual suspects. If you mm. have <laughs> weird serialization deserialization <laughs> that TensorFlow serving cannot manage natively, then you would provide mm, an inference script and you have the input fn function and okay. the output fn function and it's uh, it's pretty well documented in our sdk right Good. but most cases you you can just uh you can just get away with this okay. uh, which which is fine right so we deploy and then as usual we predict right and yeah let's predict this should still be up yes <laughs> right oh this is funny i could do that oh it's wrong so <laughs> Yeah, we got a we got a misprediction. So you can see it's not fake, right? <laughs> we don't fake anything ever. All right. So TensorFlow, right? So you can do this. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. I can do this. You can do this. <laughs> Everybody can do this. Everybody can. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's move on and look at uh, a slightly more complicated example. Right? We're going to look at PyTorch. Uh, PyTorch. And I didn't say that PyTorch is generally more complicated. Um, and we're uh, we're actually going to reuse our hugging face example. Oh. When was that? Was it episode five? Five. 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 Okay, you got a good memory. Um, yeah. So episode five this season, we showed you how to fine tune hugging face models for NLP on SageMaker. Mm -mm. Remember that we didn't show you how to deploy no. them, right? <laughs> because and friendly colleagues, 
just go away for a second, because we still do not support deployment on Hugging Face and SageMaker. Okay, we're working on it, but it's not there. Okay, yes. so you know, you know me. I, I was frustrated. Yes. I, I easily get frustrated, and I decided there's got to be another way. So this is it, right? You did it. <laughs> well, I did it, and I have to say, I found uh, a, a super, super useful blog post mm. on the machine learning blog. Um, that actually includes a CloudFormation template that deploys a hugging face model using the, the PyTorch container, which is what we're going to look at. So you, you can easily find it. Uh, it's uh, It's been written by our colleague Todd Escalona. I mm -hmm. uh, hope you got, I got your name right. Uh, Todd, okay. yeah. thank you very much. Super good post. Um, I was missing a single line and, well, reading your post helped me figure it out. So thank you. Credits. Uh, to credits to Todd for, for <laughs> getting it right, right and helping me figure it out. Okay, so uh, so here, what do we do? We this time we we actually uh, so we train uh, we train this sentiment analysis uh, uh, model. It's a hugging face model. So here, I'm actually training on SageMaker, but let's ignore that. Okay? Mm. Uh, let's completely ignore all this, <laughs> right? This never happened. You didn't see it. It's not there. Trust me, it's fine. And okay, so I actually have, uh, a, which is really a PyTorch model, right? I'm using Hugging Face as an excuse, but this would work for any PyTorch model that you already have and that you want to deploy on SageMaker. So I've got my model artifact in there, okay? Um, do you want to take a look at it just to see what PyTorch looks like? No. Cool. Why? What do you mean no? <laughs> no is not an option. Okay, <laughs> let's take a look at it. Everybody loves PyTorch. It's a big one. How much? Uh, 230 megs something. Okay. Okay, so this is what you have. Mm -hmm. in your PyTorch artifact, mm -hmm. okay? The model and the, the configuration and right. training arguments, okay? So again, if you had trained this on your local machine, your local server, you would get those three files and you would package them mm -hmm. in a model artifact and you would upload all that stuff to us, right? So here I'm taking a shortcut because we already have that. Okay, so let's pretend I built it and I put it in S3, now what, okay? Um, so here I'm going once again to use PyTorch model mm -hmm. uh, to uh, uh, import, right, so to speak, the model to SageMaker, framework version, blah blah blah, and I need an inference script. Okay. And here it's pretty. It's actually using hanging face. I think is is a good way to understand why we need this. Yes. Okay, because yes. The hugging face model, this one is implemented in PyTorch, mm -hmm. but uh, the PyTorch inference container, which is using TorchServe, right, the, the vanilla one, doesn't know anything about hugging face. Oh, okay. okay, so well, that's why we need to provide that script where we actually load using the hugging face APIs, mm -hmm. and yeah, then it's it's a legit PyTorch model but we're actually using the Hugging Face API. So that makes sense, right? Mm -mm, that mm -mm. makes sense why we need that script. So let's okay. yeah. let's look at the script. It's not, it's not terribly complicated. So we have that model fn function, which is responsible for actually loading the model. Mm -hmm. So here, loading a Hugging Face model is, is very simple. Uh, so from the artifact, we have the config file and we have the, the model itself. So we load the config. Uh, using autoconfig, and here I train a distilbert model specialized for sequence Imagine. classification, and I just load the model and its configuration, right? And I return that. And now this thing, this model, is really a PyTorch model. Okay. Okay. And then fine. It's all, then it's all good. Then uh, the container knows how to invoke it, okay. right? But you see, we're using uh, transformer APIs, and of course the vanilla container wouldn't know how to do that. So when we have 
a proper hugging face container for deployment, I'm guessing we won't need to do that because mm. the logic will be in there. Okay. Maybe we will have to, well, let's see, I'm not uh, making any promises, but I'm guessing it will be simpler. Uh, and then we need a prediction function, okay? So uh, taking the input data, which mm -hmm. is a, a text sentence, um, this is, a, a, again, a sentiment analysis model. So we pass uh, text, customer reviews, and we predict them just like that. We take the output, uh, uh, not probabilities, because this is uh, these are really activation values, right? Okay. We didn't apply softmax. We could apply softmax and return probabilities here. We keep it simple. We just look for the top activation value, which indicates the top class, and we return the name of that class, which is negative. Okay. And then those, those input and output functions, I'm guessing, I'm not sure, but I think they're actually optional here because uh, I think JSON would be uh, would be supported natively by TorchServe. So not sure, need to check. Um, but again, if you have different serialization, you could be clever here, right? Okay. I don't want to be clever. I'm fine with JSON for once, right? <laughs> okay. so. Um, again, load the model, predict, and you can see these are super simple, easy mm. to easy to adapt, right? And finally, once we've done that, yeah, we can deploy as usual, and then we can predict, and we can see this is a positive review, and it's positive, and this is a negative review, and it's negative, right? Perfect. So that's it. That's that's PyTorch. Okay, same same logic, just you know, just a little bit of a customization mm -hmm. here uh, because again we're using a face uh, but this shows you it's not terribly complicated no. to uh, to do that right you just need to once you have a working example as always it's so much easier to uh, mm -hmm. to adapt okay and uh, yeah and don't worry don't don't forget go and look at the at Todd's post on on serving um, uh, pytorch models with uh, uh, with torch it's it's uh, really really useful Okay, uh, what did I forget? Uh, I think that's about it. I think that's about it. Okay, so we looked at X importing XJBoost, um, TensorFlow, PyTorch. and PyTorch. Okay, so the main ones, uh, the ones that I didn't cover, like scikit-learn, is you can absolutely use the same technique as XJBoost. Mm -hmm. um, and MXNet is, is very, very similar to this, right? Build the artifact. And, and use the MXNet model and then call deploy. Right? Mm -hmm. And again, in most cases, you I don't think you will ever, you will even need an, a serialization, uh, uh, an inference script, right? okay. unless you have weird serialization. So you should be, you should be covered here. You want to, move, let's move to exporting. Maybe, yeah? yes. Yeah, let's do exporting. <laughs> okay. What does it mean, exporting? So exporting, in this case, means we train on SageMaker, mm -hmm. but for whatever the reason is, we do not want to deploy on SageMaker. Okay. okay. Uh, so we now we know what to do. We need to grab the artifact okay. in S3. And export them. Extract it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, copy it to mm -hmm. wherever. Extract the model inside, and then use whatever we like to load the model and predict with it. Okay. Okay. So we're going to look at a few examples. Um, here is the first one, which is, I think, XJBoost. Okay, so, all right, um, training an XJBoost model, okay, as we've done many times. Okay, and this is still the same direct marketing data set, binary classification. But, okay, SageMaker business as usual. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I almost forgot. <laughs> It's all right, a all right. good example. Yeah, yeah, it's a good example. So we train nothing particularly different here. We train and train and train, and let's not look at the log here. Okay, so we call fit, and as we've seen, we can easily retrieve the artifact. Mm -hmm. um, you don't even need to go and look at anything. You can do this programmatically. Uh, there's a, a, a member in. Uh, in the estimator, it's called model data that actually points okay. uh, to that uh, exact location. Mm -hmm. So you can automate all of it, right? Uh, and uh, so I can copy this and I can extract it. OK, 
and we've seen before uh, that this contains that XGB pickled object. Okay. So now loading it is super simple. Okay. Once again, the only gotcha, I guess, is version problems. Okay. Okay. As you know. API differences across versions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So make sure uh, here we train with uh, XJBoost one to one. So let's load with it one to one. Okay. Although I'm, I guess you know, if we tried you know one two two or maybe one three, you, you know, it would certainly work. But you know. Uh, Again, it's hard to know in advance. Just use your own version. If you mm -hmm. run into problems, then stick to the same version that you use for Chrome. Okay, and it's it is as easy as this, right? Create a, 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 a an empty booster object, mm -hmm. and then just load the pickled object. Okay. That's it, right? And here, for example, I'm dumping that object to a t to a text file, and this is literally my uh, my XGB set of trees, right? Okay. Right. So then you can go and you can predict with it directly. It's trade. It's there. Okay. Perfect. So, you know, I get a lot of questions on that. I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, I mean, literally all the time people ask me, I want to use that model. I want to import that model. I want to export that model. And and they get all, uh, you know, anxious. And and it's it's not hard, right? Again, if you have working examples to start from, it's so much easier. Which is why we're doing this today. But yeah, you can see it's easy to go and and, mm -hmm. and, and do those things, right? So let's uh, let's do the same with TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fashion fashion MNIST again, training, da da da, retrieving, retrieving the model artifact. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, let's do. Of course, we could load it here, but let's do it differently. Okay, let's show you something else. <laughs> so. On my local machine, and this is really my local machine this time. Oh. Yes. Okay. Machine. All right. Uh, what did I do? I loaded and extracted. Okay. Uh, okay. This uh, this artifact. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is really yeah. Same thing. Copy, extract it to this directory, and we're going to try and uh, so let me copy that command. Okay, we're going to start to we're going to try to load the model locally with uh, TensorFlow serving in a Docker container. Okay, and if this looks complicated, I actually copied and pasted it from the TensorFlow serving doc, okay. and I just used my own path. Okay, so it's not hard. Uh, yeah, so this is the path. Uh, this is the model we want to serve, and that's it, right? And of course, you need to pull the TensorFlow serving image first. So I've done that before. And we actually run this. Ooh. <laughs> yes. Success, success, okay. Ah, success. <laughs> yeah, I thanks. love it. OK. So that's it. Uh, it's loaded, right? And, uh, and then, you know, so uh, uh, TensorFlow serving is uh, is exposing its API on my local machine, and I can use it as usual. Good. Okay, so nothing complicated here, right? Nothing complicated here. Just need to know what to look for. Okay. All right. See? <laughs> yeah. Like I say all the time, I, I I waste a lot of my of my own time yeah. so that you don't have to. Right, and if you think this worked on the first attempt, it didn't. <laughs> it never does. Okay? It never does. That's never, okay. Never. I'm, I, I don't care. I just hope it's gonna work on the first attempt for you. That's that's the important bit, right? Again, I I'm paid to waste my time so that you don't have to, <laughs> right? And I'm so good at wasting my time. I'm brilliant at it. Okay. So here's another option, and of course, if you wanted. Uh, here I ran this uh, container locally, but if you mm -hmm. wanted to deploy on ECS or okay. or EKS uh, or you know any Docker platform, you you could do the same. Okay, just right? recommend it. Yeah, you could run you could run this on on your cluster and and off it goes. Right. It works. Actually, we're gonna do an example later on. Yeah, I'm gonna look at uh, deploying on the, a Docker cluster. <laughs> yes. Ah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, so, what about built-in algorithms? 
Yeah, we've, we've covered built-in algos. Yeah, in, in, yeah. yeah, in a lot of detail, uh, blazing text, and uh, and um, yeah, I guess we did image classification. Um, yeah, we did. Yeah, 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 we did. Um, season two, yeah. yeah, last season we did a lot of those uh, uh, NTM, LDA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a lot. Okay, so why are those different? Those are different because, as you may know, they are implemented with Apache MXNet. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and so we need a slightly different logic to work here. So let's see how we could export um, a, a, the image classification model. Okay, mm -hmm. so model trained with the image classification built-in algo. And and I, the reason I picked this this one is because this is really a popular algo. I mean, yeah. I know lots of customers are using it because it's it's such an easy way to to build computer vision models. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so. And object detection and segmentation are the same. Are the same. These are really complex mm -hmm. models to work with. And I think the, the, the built-ins for computer vision are really, really simplifying uh, process, the yeah. work yeah, for, for developers. So here I'm going to show you image classification, but it's it's working the same for uh, all the other built-ins. Okay. And for the record, the only one that's not an MXNet implementation is uh, the built-in XGBoost. XGBoost, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that's it. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. And blazing text is a little bit different because blazing text actually saves models that are compatible with fast text. Ah, uh, yes. The, fa the Facebook uh, algo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but all the other ones like linear learner, uh, KNN, uh, LDA, uh, LDA etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all these are MXNet. So, okay. So what I've done here is I've run this uh, example from the SageMaker example uh, repositories. Repository. So. It's a, it's a transfer learning example on the Caltech data set. We may have shown this one before, I don't remember. But yeah, go and go and run this, okay? So just run this notebook as is, and, and just write down the location of the artifact. Okay. Okay? Again, model tar JZ, nothing special. And now you know the story, we copy it, we extract it, and we see We see those things a little bit different. So oh, yeah. we see this dot params file, mm -hmm. which, as you would expect, is the model itself, the parameters that were learned. Uh, this number is not random; it's the number of epochs okay. this ran for. Okay. So here, it's okay. a fine-tuning, a transfer learning example that runs for two epochs, and so this is why we have two. Okay. Okay. Good to know as well. Yes, <laughs> I think so. Uh, then you have a JSON file, uh, which is, I guess we can open that. Ooh, <laughs> not like that. Just open with editor. Yes. Who, who thought it would be nice to look at the JSON? All right, so we can see, this is not for humans, don't worry. Okay, we can see basically the layers and, and all the functions and all the operators, right? Oh. Convolution. Blah, 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 blah. So it's literally the model definition. Okay, I'll show you in a yeah, minute yeah. a better way <laughs> a better to visualize way. <laughs> it. Let's close those yes. JSON files. Terrible and JSON. model shapes is important because guess what? This is the input shape oh, okay. of the model. So the input tensor for this model is called data. Mm -hmm. Pretty good name, and it has a shape of so that's batch size. Okay. So this was trained with 128 batches, as I'm guessing. Number of channels, mm -hmm. three, because this is a, a computer vision model that works on color images, okay. red, green, and blue. Okay. All right. And images are 224 by 224. Okay. So this is, yeah, this is really useful because, is yeah, knowing this is important if, if you want to invoke the model. Mm -hmm. Okay. So take a look at this. This tells you what you need to know to invoke the model correct, right? Good. Uh, okay, so uh, no, that's not the right one. This is the one. Okay, so let's close this, extract the model, and 
this is the bit that's a little people will be a little less familiar with because you know maybe they're a little less familiar with mxnet mm -hmm. in general so don't worry there's nothing really weird here um and um if you don't understand the details you know uh, that's fine you can just go and read the doc but it, i'll try to explain what goes on here okay so yeah so first i need to load the the model definition as, mm -hmm. a, as a json file okay and then I'm using this API in, in Gluon. Okay, remember Gluon is is the uh, um, is the imperative API of MXNet. Okay, I don't want to be too theoretical here, but MXNet originally was a symbolic framework, mm -hmm. kind of like early TensorFlow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then it added an imperative API, kind of like PyTorch, and this is called Gluon. So here we can just say basically, hey, please instantiate this model. It's really what it does. Loading that crazy JSON file that we saw um, and setting the input tensor as data. This is why you need to know okay. that this is called data. Okay. Right? Otherwise, bad things will happen. Okay? <laughs> right. That's all you need to know. We're instantiating that model based on its definition and setting the name of the input tensor. And this is a really cool one. I think. I so know. MXNet has this API called Plot Network, where, uh, again, passing the, the model, you can say, hey, I want to see it, right? So this is actually, so that's softmax here. So it's actually the output layer. Mm -hmm. So you need to scroll all the way down, <laughs> <laughs> right? OK, so that's where it starts. Cool. OK, data, input tensor. I'm guessing this is batch normalization. And then here we go, convolution and batch norm and activation with real and pooling, right? So if you can't sleep tonight, just you can play the game and watch through all the, uh, go through all the steps. Is this a skip connection? Maybe. I think it looks yes, like. It looks like. Yes. <laughs> and if you don't know what a skip connection is, you haven't been paying attention because <laughs> Sego explained all of it a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we can see, oh, we can see this model in all its glory. And by the way, this is a ResNet model. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is why I'm pretty sure these are skip connections. That's what ResNet does. Okay, and you can see all the layers. Okay. It's actually a cool way to see how models are built. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Uh, better than your JSON. <laughs> much better than JSON. So. If, you, if you're curious about certain models, you can load them in Gluon mm -hmm. uh, and then use that API to plot them and, uh, and yeah, just check that, oh yeah, you understand the architecture, mm -hmm. okay? This is pretty hard to fit in PowerPoint slides, unfortunately, but <laughs> um, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's a really Super nifty, yeah, it's a nifty feature. Yeah. Okay, so now we have the model, but it's empty, right? It's, it's blank, so we need to initialize it with the training parameters. Okay. Okay. And, and then we need to call initialize to uh, initialize some of the runtime parameters. Okay, that's, that's all you need to know. And it complains a lot about warnings that we can ignore. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then we can predict. So here, I, you know, I, I was a little bit lazy here. Uh, we could load an actual image. Here, I just generated a random okay. uh, tensor. Uh, so size one because it's only one image right three, three channels three. because it's red green and uh, blue mm -hmm. and it's 224 to 24. so it's just a random uh, uh a random uh, tensor and those are in mxnet those are called nd arrays okay. which are really tensors okay and it's very similar to numpy arrays and then we just predict <laughs> i'm not sure what we're <laughs> predicting here but we're predicting okay just call net get a response and the shape of that response is a vector of 257 probabilities because Caltech data set we fine tune on has 256 classes plus what they call a clutter class, which is just a bunch of random garbage to make the model learn a little bit harder. Okay, so there you go, not hard. And you can apply that to all the MXNet models, all the all, all the, the actual MXNet models. If you train M proper MXNet models, that works. And all the built-ins that are based on MXNet, you can do the same. Perfect. Right. Only thing again you need to pay attention to is the shape okay. and the name of the input tensor, but that is stored 
in that JSON file in the, in the audio. Right? Okay, one more? That's one. Yes, we have 10 minutes. 10 minutes Perfect. before. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so all you container fans out there, oh I'm going to like God. this. <laughs> Say go, take a deep breath. It's going to be great. So uh, let me show you how to deploy a TensorFlow model on a container service. Okay. And I, I've selected Fargate. Uh, which uh, is uh, serverless, mm -hmm. even better, right? That's the easiest way to work with uh, with containers, as, as far as I'm concerned. A lot of people will disagree, but I, I really like Fargate. <laughs> uh, that's fine. So high-level process. Start from, uh, in this case, a TensorFlow artifact. Okay. So Extract okay. it, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we've seen this before. Now. What I'm going to do is I'm actually uh, taking the model that we extracted here and I'm committing it to GitHub repo. Mm -hmm. Okay, because on the container that's going to run on Fargate, I'm just going to clone that repo, extract that model, and fire up TensorFlow serving inside the container to serve the wishes. Okay, so you don't have to use a Git repo, but it, for me, for demos, it's it's the easiest way. Okay, so we'll see uh, how that works. Uh, no time to explain uh, ECS and Fargate in detail. Uh, there's a command line tool which is called ECS CLI that lets us do some operations like creating a cluster, listing the tasks that are running on clusters. Uh, so yeah, we need to install it. Okay. Um, creating a cluster is as easy as this. Right? And it's instant because it's serverless. Oh. Right? So you don't have to wait for anything. And if you go to the Fargate console, you're going to see your cluster, right? It's immediately available. Okay. Very nice. Uh, and I'm going to set this container as my default container to work with. And yeah, I can list, I can use ECS CLIPS to see if anything's running on it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, Simple command line to check what the cluster is doing. Um, my containers are going to log stuff, so mm -hmm. uh, I need a log group in CloudWatch Logs, mm -hmm. right? You just need to create this once. And I need to register uh, what is called a task definition, which really lists what the task that I'm going to run on, on, uh, on the container looks like. And you need to register it once. And yeah, let's maybe look at the file itself. I don't really enjoy that uh, <laughs> JSON viewer. Okay, so right, it looks it looks complicated, but it's really not. So uh, this is the image I'm using, right? Okay. So it's actually the deep learning container for TensorFlow 232 uh, for CPU. Okay. So it's unchanged, right? Um, I use the existing container. So this is the same container that SageMaker uses actually, okay. right, for, uh, for CPU inference, same one. And the command that I'm going to run inside that container is clone the repo, start TensorFlow serving, uh, loading the model okay. that we cloned. Okay. okay. So that's it. That's what the container does. Fire up TensorFlow serving, load the model, kind of like I've done in mm -hmm. locally a few minutes ago. Okay. Okay. And of course, I want to serve predictions from there. So I need to map the two TensorFlow serving ports, 8500, 8500, 8501. Okay. Uh, one is for uh, the REST API, and uh, the other one is uh, gRPC, if I remember correctly. The logs. Okay. So please log all that stuff to AWS logs, blah, 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 whatever I created. And just a couple of network settings, nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh, just for reference, and I shouldn't say this, but this is actually a demo I first built in 2018. Oh, three years ago. For the Stockholm Summit. Hi, Sweden. <laughs> uh, and I resurrected it, and believe it or not, Here. the only thing I changed, pro I promise it's true, is this. I just updated the container image, and it ran on the first try. So stability. API stability <laughs> for the win, baby. Yes. Thank you, ECS. <laughs> right? Big fan. Big fan. Really, literally, I just updated this and it ran. Okay? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. 
Okay, so now that we have a cluster, now that we have a task definition, uh, we need to run the task. Okay, so I, here I'm using the AWS command line, ECS run task, which cluster I'm running it on, which task definition I'm using, how many tasks do I want, where do I want to launch this, Fargate, right? And yeah, this, this one is a little, uh, yeah, unfriendly, but it's basically saying, uh, please launch this task in this VPC in this subnet. Okay. With this security group, okay. okay, because I want uh, I want uh, this to be publicly accessible. Okay, okay, I want my container to be uh, to have a public IP. So, of course, I need to run this inside a public subnet in one of my VPCs and with a security group that, as you would think, opens 8500 and 8501. Okay. Uh, that's that's fine. Uh, you can use any subnet in your default VPC, yeah, any pr public. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So this runs. Blah 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 blah. And now, okay, let's try and run this. Oh yeah. Okay. So I can see this task, right, is running, and this is the public IP for it. So now, if I take that IP and if I build uh, um, a URL uh, with the TensorFlow serving format. Mm -hmm. Right, IP address, the port, V1, models, blah, 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 predict, okay. I should be able to invoke stuff. So um, this is the still the fashion MNIST model. So I'm loading the fashion MNIST data set okay. and I'm using uh, a, a completely standard uh, URL invocation here. I'm not using SageMaker at all, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not SageMaker. It's, it's uh, an API running inside a container. So, okay. right, no more SageMaker here. And I use the requests library from, from Python, but you could use anything in, in a different language. And I post, yeah, I post the, the data, so a few, a few images uh, to the endpoint, right? And let's try that again. Oh. <laughs> nah, nah, I know what it is. Here we go, all right, all right. Need to run those two cells because I'm messing around with it. <laughs> All right. Oh, no errors. It looks fake. <laughs> I want to see errors. Yes. Okay. One missed prediction here. Okay. So I, I'm probably still going to be doing this demo five years from now because I love it, I have to say. Um, because it shows that, yeah, you know, you can train. This one is a super simple model, but let's say you train, you know, you fine tune you, your crazy hugging face or crazy PyTorch model on a, a GPU cluster on SageMaker mm -hmm. for using managed infrastructure that's, you know, you would never dream of buying yourself because it's mm -hmm. very expensive and you don't need it all the time. So leverage the scalability of SageMaker for training and then grab the model, uh, put it on your local Docker cluster for me, even for testing, right? I mean, if you want to, if your dev and test environment are on premise, fine, go and do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's totally okay. And honestly, you see, it's not a lot of work. No. Get the artifact extracted and then either put it in a container directly or load it like I've done with a Git clone, which is probably not a good way for production, but for testing, it's fine. And then that's it, you know, uh, the task definition is nothing to worry about. Uh, you should already have that if you work with uh, container services on AWS, and that's it. So you can see it, it really fits nicely together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really, I really like that, and I really like the fact that you know I don't have to manage the cluster, right? Um, that's that's what the cluster looks like, you know. No instances to manage. How cool is that? You know, yeah. fully yeah. managed, serverless, serverless, and I can see the task, it's and I can see it's running. You know, it's it's all good, right? I can see uh, I can see all that stuff here that I, that I used in the task definition. Okay, and I can see the log. Look, amazing. Yeah, perfect. It just works. I love cherry it. on the cake. Yes, <laughs> cherry on the cake. Where's my T-shirt? All right, all right. Okay, so uh, yeah, I guess one minute left. No, no, we are absolutely on time. Have we ever been late? I'm not no. sure. No. Uh, maybe, maybe a couple. <laughs> okay, so uh, as always, give me a few minutes. Uh, I will, I will copy. Uh, sorry, I will commit 
those notebooks to the usual repository. This is where you will find all the SageMaker Friday uh, notebooks for, for season three. And for those of you who have been too busy to watch previous episodes, I'd like to remind you that you can watch uh, all of them uh, on YouTube mm -hmm. and of course on the Twitch channel that you're looking at right now. Okay, but if you're watching them on YouTube, then I get the views. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please use YouTube. Right? Okay. I like to get the views. And you can ask me questions, right? Uh, yeah, and you respond. Yes, you can leave a comment and most of the time I'm going to respond, right? If I'm not responding, it's because either I'm too busy or I didn't understand the question or I simply don't. Know. Okay, <laughs> all right. But yeah, uh, yeah, YouTube and for those of you who have posted questions, thank you. I, I love that. And, uh, and you can uh, you can post more, okay? All right, so uh, I think we're done. Yeah. So I'm, I'm quite sure we'll be back at some point, uh, but there are other things we need to work on uh, and this is it for now. So Sego, thank you very much thank for so joining much, me for those eight crazy episodes. That's great. Uh, yeah, it was good fun. We'll certainly, uh, certainly do more uh, uh, in, in a few months, right? And uh, once, uh, once we're, we've cleared a few things out of the way, <laughs> no, I didn't say reInvent. Reinvent's going to keep us busy for a long time. Uh, but we have other projects and we need to pause for now. So thank you so much. Until then, uh, you know, please connect, keep get going. in touch, ask questions, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, anywhere you can find me. Um, yeah, yeah. Zoom, on the moon? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> working on it. Working on it. Uh, yeah, working on it. I'll be on that rocket. That uh, and until then, keep, keep rocking. rocking with machine learning. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you very much. See you soon. <laughs>